Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's Power Talk Unscripted, uh, featuring Jim Salikas from the class of 2008, co-founder of Cousins Maine Lobster. I'm Daniel Klinghard. I teach political science at Holy Cross, and I'm the director of the JD Power Center for Liberal Arts in the World. I'm joined today by Mara Sweeney, Director of Alumni Career Development, and we're happy to welcome you all to today's talk. Uh, we created Power Talks as a way to help alums share their inspiring stories of how they use their Holy Cross education to make a big difference in the world. We hope this can help current students uh, intentionally reflect on their own aspirations to discern their own path toward making a difference in the world. When we're on campus, Power Talks are held in front of a small audience and recorded, and this encourages student alumni interaction, but it also allows us to post video of the talk online for a wider audience. Now, these days, in the midst of this global pandemic with so many of our students away from campus, we think it's more important than ever to share stories like this. And we hope we find, that you find this helpful to you as you continue to think about your future, even if you're stuck at home and uncertain about what's gonna happen uh, in the fall. We set aside an hour for today's talk. We've invited Tom Crimmins from the class of 2021 to interview Jim about his life, his career, and how his Holy Cross experience helped to prepare him to forge his own path as an entrepreneur. After the formal interview, we're gonna open up the discussion to the group uh, and we'll be recording that. Uh, now let me turn it over to Maura. Fantastic, thank you and, and welcome everyone. Now for a little bit of housekeeping, we ask that you please keep your microphone muted during the duration of the interview. Um, you also might wanna activate speaker view just to make it less distracting as you can focus on the interview itself. We encourage you to come off of mute during the Q&A, then you might wanna switch back to gallery view in order to participate in the discussion. You're also welcome to submit thoughts and questions in the chat. Uh, the presentation is recorded as uh, Professor Klinghard mentioned, will be made available to all participants in a few days. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to Jim. Jim Salikas is a co-founder of Cousins Maine Lobster. He is from the coast of Maine, where he and his cousin, Sabine Lomack, grew up surrounded by family and lobster. They both moved away, Jim to Boston and the College of the Holy Cross, then a secure job at Stryker Orthopedics. Sabine to New York City to study drama before acting his way into a career in real estate in LA. Then they reunited in 2012 to bring the authentic experience of their childhoods to their customers. Salikas and Lomax started Cousins Maine Lobster as a single food truck in Los Angeles in 2012, serving authentic lobster rolls. They appeared on ABC's Shark Tank and received a $55,000 investment from Barbara Corcoran. Well done. Their business now has 20 food trucks in 13 cities across the country, along with several franchise locations. With that, I'll hand things over to Tom and Jim to find out a little bit more about this story and how he became so successful. Awesome, thank you, Mara. Thank you for uh, kicking thank it you. off there for us. So, um, Jim, first off, uh, good afternoon. And uh, so the first question I have for you, I know we uh, just heard a lot about your background, sort of just, you know, the, the high view of your background, but first sort of just, just tell me, um, a little bit more in depth from the time that you graduated Holy Cross to where you are now. Tell me just a little bit about your background and a little bit about your journey. Yeah, for sure. I, um, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, and um, I look forward to this for the next hour. So it's uh, like Maura said, I mean, I grew up um, in a small town, uh, Cape Elizabeth, Maine, which is, you know, Southern Maine, Portland, Maine, you know, 10 minutes from Portland or so. Um, did my whole life there through middle school, high school and um, ended up at Holy Cross where I did uh, 2004 to 2008 uh, as a graduate and uh, or graduated in 2008 and from there I um, pretty much spent five years or so in Boston um, and that is where I was working for Strike Orthopedics um, which more re referenced um, which is a medical device company so I was doing medical device sales of um, you know total hips, knee joints, um, things, plates and screws and nails that would go in, um, you know, be implemented uh, during surgeries for broken femurs, broken hips, uh, ankles, wrists, uh, you name it. And it was a really interesting job, loved every minute of it. Um, and then in 2011, my cousin and I, who also grew up in Maine with me, uh, started kind of thinking about the idea of, of what 
uh, inevitably became Cousins Maine Lobster in 2012. Um, and I moved from Boston to Los Angeles on a whim um, in October, early November of 2012. And I have been here ever since. I get back and forth a lot because of our product sourcing from Maine and my parents are still there. Um, but yeah, moved out here with one food truck in 2012. We now have 38 trucks throughout the country, uh, three units in Taiwan. There's 11 restaurants throughout the country. Um, so about a total of 50 units and uh, eight years later, here we are. That's awesome. So um, given the, the fact that, you know, a lot of our audience today is students. So let me first uh, ask you just a little bit more about your time at Holy Cross, you know, just uh, some basic stuff. What was your major? Uh, what kind of activities did you uh, participate in? You know, where did you live? So just some, you know, some of the basic, your Holy Cross facts. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I was a political, political science um, major. Don't know how I fared in that class, um, but maybe Professor Quinter could put more light on that later. Um, but I did, I mean, poli sci was, was my major. I had actually thought about doing econ originally. Um, and my goal as a freshman, I think, was to graduate uh, and I wanted to go to law school. Uh, that kind of changed my sophomore year. Um, that was my major. I Freshman year, I was in Wheeler. Um, and junior year, I was actually in RA, um, which was my first kind of go at that. Um, and throughout my uh, four years there, I played hockey. Um, so I was, I was on the hockey team, um, men's ice hockey, and um, it was a nice, uh, it was a really nice thing for me personally, because obviously, you know, as a, as a kid, I wanted to play in the NHL. Those dreams didn't come true. Um, but it was nice to be able to, uh, you know, have the time management, understand the disciplines of focusing on academics and, and sports. So whatever is your thing, whether it's, art or theater, sports, or uh, nothing at all in those spaces, but uh, solely academics. Like for me, it was, it was pairing those two. It was making sure that I had an outstanding uh, academic uh, institution to go to and focus on uh, my studies, but also um, got to kind of pursue my, my desires to, to play hockey and see where that would go. So um, that's a little bit about, I guess, me on campus and had phenomenal friends. I think that's the one thing uh, my biggest takeaway from Holy Cross at the end of the day are the relationships there just seem so far more uh, profound, uh, in-depth, meaningful. Uh, this could be a personal bias of mine, but my Holy Cross friends in core compared to my other friends from other colleges, um, even, you know, my cousin Sabin, they just don't seem to have had that same type of meaning to their, to their friendships in college. So if, that, if you take anything from this, um, enjoy those relationships and, and certainly um, keep leaning on them after you guys graduate. Absolutely. And, you know, I can definitely tell, uh, you know, even as a current student, having some of those relationships form, I can definitely sort of relate to that. And also definitely very glad to hear that you spent some time in Wheeler as I spent a year there myself. And I <laughs> right. it. So uh, as far as, as you said, you're a political science major and, you know, now you started your own business. So uh, I guess my qu uh, one question sort of zeroing in, zeroing in on your academic experience at Holy Cross, are there any specific uh, classes, helpful classes that you remember or professors or anything specific that you remember that even helps you today? Yeah, I mean, it's funny to think back um, because one, these are off the cuff, but I do think it was interesting when I got this email uh, or the, the opportunity to, to do this talk because when I saw Professor Klinger's name, I always do remember just how truly like buttoned up his classes were, you know, because of the way that he was um, and how uh, kind of information was um, communicated and delivered to the students, um, which I was always appreciative of because I wasn't, you know, necessarily the fastest learner. Um, I just focused on trying to work hard and, and study notes and whatever. So the more, the better communication there was, the more clarity there was, something I appreciate. Sounds like I'm brown nosing. I'm not. Uh, there's, there's no reason to be doing that now. Um, but I do have it with some other professors too. I mean, I remember uh, I had a class with Professor Yule. I don't even know if she's still there. Um, really appreciated my time with her because she was really, in my opinion, charismatic um, and, and, and outgoing. And I think that kind of broke the um, barrier maybe between student and teacher and made it more um, 
you know, there's a real connection there. You say, okay, we're kind of in this together. You're teaching and I've got to perform. Um, but that was something I appreciated there. And then also Father Vidoclus, um, I took a, a few classes with him. And um, I just remember really kind of talking to him a lot in his office um, outside of, of, you know, the actual classes. And I just think that there's a lot of different variety of professors and whatever it is that fits your need as a student. Uh, I would try and tap into those, whether it's the way that I learn best, uh, the things I appreciate about, um, you know, outside of the classroom of, of that connection. Um, those were kind of uh, some, some professors and in, in times that I certainly remember. Absolutely. So um, I know that one, uh, one question that a lot of Holy Cross students have, or even, you know, just students in general, uh, that are attending a liberal arts school as opposed to some of their peers. You know, some people are, are you know, attending more of uh, you know, uh, schools and you know, more business focused uh, curriculum or options. So as someone who sort of you know, went through the liberal arts education and curriculum, can you sort of speak to how that, how that has affected your ability or you know, advantages and disadvantages as you, know, you began and continue to run your own business? Yeah, great question, because I, I was wondering that at the time, too, you know, going from a liberal arts school versus maybe something that was uh, a more specific uh, education to what you think you want to do. I mean, my takeaway is, I don't know as so many people know at the age of whatever, young 20s when you're graduating, that you know what you want to do. And if you think you know what you want to do, it may change in a year or two or three years. And so how well prepared are you for whatever you find your passions or your skill sets uh, to fit most? Um, to me, again, it's about kind of the whole. It's about the well-rounded experience you have, which I think uh, my, my experience at Holy Cross and probably a lot of liberal arts school provide that. If, you, if I were to, at one point when I thought, hey, I should have done something more specific, um, you know, if you do that, you might pigeonhole yourself um, and, and, and think that you put all your eggs in one basket and say, this is where you want to go. And then all of a sudden, that's not what you want to do when you're 25 or when you're 30 uh, or when you want to pivot Maybe you wish you had um, kind of more of that liberal arts education, if you will. And aside from all of that, I think that at the end of the day, it's up to you. It's up to you to um, learn, to work hard, to be disciplined, whether you're at a more specific type of uh, you know, college education or if you're at a liberal arts school. And when you get out, it's the same thing. So are you going to take those lessons and the things that you um, were learning and, and the skill sets you've developed and apply them and, and make make them better as, as life goes on, uh, or are you not? So I don't, I don't think you just graduate all of a sudden. It's one thing I've certainly learned, just because you graduate from a great school, with a great GPA, uh, liberal arts or not, doesn't get you a job overnight, doesn't make you a millionaire, um, and it sure as hell doesn't um, you know, set you up for a success. Like a lot of the work still starts after college. That's what we say about you know, after we went on Shark Tank, that the real work started after that. It's not that you go on a reality show and people think you become millionaires overnight or that your business is so successful. I always argue that it's quite the opposite. You have a target on your back. I think there's a real opportunity to have your business flounder because you're not ready to handle the, um, the, the eyes on you and that heightened sense of this better be perfect because people go because they saw it on TV. Um, so there's, there's no guarantee regardless of, of where you come from. I, I do think this, I, Barbara from Shark Tank has always said to us, she's like, the best MBA you will ever get is starting your own business and going through that whirlwind that is after Shark Tank. Um, with hindsight, you know, here of eight years past Shark Tank, I think personally to me that that resonates. Um, I don't think I could have learned at an MBA program what I learned through starting this business. Um, and I have friends that have gone and got their MBAs. I'm always for more, more education, but I can sit there and look at those type of things and say, well, I learned as much or I went through more real life scenarios than maybe they would have covered in school. So when you talk about liberal arts or some other education, I really think it's what you make of it in that moment and uh, you know, post-graduation. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's awesome advice. And specifically, you know, when you say it's what you make of it, you know, there are definitely a lot of students, I would say, in recent years, I would say we've had a lot more interest in sort of entrepreneur, entrepreneurial studies, you know, students wanting to start their own, you know, whether it be short term, start their own business, or they're starting to think in the long term, maybe even, you know, for a career to start something, you know, a few years out of school. Are there any activities or skill sets or during their time at Holy Cross, these students, is there anything 
in particular that you would recommend that they study up on or they do or they sort of figure out during their four years? Yeah, that's a hard one. I think, um, and I said because I think some of the best people we've hired and grown with um, in our business, we're, we're a franchise business. Um, so our, we are the franchisor. Um, meaning if you think of McDonald's, they are, it's a franchise, right? Going to McDonald's, it's the same. There's a bunch of franchisees throughout the country and the world. And then there's a franchisor, corporate McDonald's. Um, so our team in Los Angeles is corporate cousins, Maine Lobster, the franchisor. And the best people we've hired to build that team are a uh, former soccer coach from New York, um, a Boston College graduate, um, and a, para, a former paralegal, um, an assistant, and there's about five or six other members on our team that had no formal training, formal education, formal schooling that would get you ready for a startup, Cousins Maine Lobster. Um, so I think that when you ask that question about, hey, is there anything to focus on at Holy Cross? Um, I really think it is about whatever it is that you're focused on, schooling, sports, uh, again, theater, whatever it may be, music. Um, if you do it well and keep challenging yourself and keep pushing yourself and trying to get better and better every day, I think those intangible pieces come along with you as a person or they certainly develop, right? Your, your work ethic, your commis commitment, your, your hustle and grind. When someone tells you no or Professor Klinger gives you a D on a test instead of an A, how do you make it an A? Um, how, do you, how do you make the team you didn't make? Um, and I think that those are the traits that when I look at, that's what makes the gentleman who was an assistant before he came and became our brand and project manager for the entire country or the gentleman who was a soccer coach, um, the vice president of our franchise operations, because they have those traits that you can just, we can train our own culture, our own standards, our way of doing things. They're coachable. And you know that whatever you give them, uh, a trumpet, a test, a hockey stick, um, whatever it may be at Holy Cross, they're going to figure it out and, and develop it over a course of time on their own. Um, so to me, those are, it's more about the person and kind of what, what their makeup is than it is, oh, I, I was a poli-sci major or, oh, I was an athlete or whatever it may be. Um, given with certain things, you can say, oh, I bet they have great um, hustle and grind. But even then, there's plenty of people that speak about having that and you show up and you, you get them going for six months and realize that they don't actually have what they have on their resume. So, um, you know, it's, I don't mean to not give a specific answer, but I really think it's more about um, working to curate who you are and, and what you want to do and those um, skill sets you have within things that you're passionate about. Because if you're not passionate about working for a lobster company or an engineering company or a design company, then most likely you're probably not going to really flourish or provide to the company what they're going to want and fulfill yourself with what you want. Um, so whatever your things are at Holy Cross, um, just I really keep, keep honing in on them and, and fine tuning them every day. And then I think you become very valuable to whoever your employer may be someday or to whatever company you may start. No, absolutely. I think that makes complete sense. I, I, I think that's absolutely a specific enough answer. And I, and I, you know, I agree, you know, nothing, it's definitely only worth doing if you're passionate about it. So I definitely think that's a good message, especially to you know, the students in attendance. So that's awesome. So you briefly spoke about uh, some, of the, some of your team. You said you hired a Boston College graduate. Uh, you know, a lot of people, a lot of students, when they come to Holy Cross, they hear about this, you know, this alumni network, you know, this great alumni network, which you know, a lot of students are able to utilize. So maybe with, you know, with Cousins Maine Lobster itself, or even with uh, sort of networking and getting you know, your first job out of college at Stryker, um, can you just speak to what your experience has been, you know, talking to fellow Holy Cross alums, whether, you know, helping you out or, you know, uh, maybe alums from your class or even, you know, after you graduated. So has the, you know, the Holy Cross alumni network, how have you interacted with it? And how, how's it helped you in your career and your progression? Yeah, it's actually, it's, um, you know, before I went to Holy Cross, I remember my mother, uh, telling me that she had a bunch of friends or acquaintances that had graduated from Holy Cross, their children or 
whomever had and that they always spoke highly of the uh of the network and the alumni relations i don't think you really necessarily know that until you graduate when you can reach out to someone or or as you're about to graduate and you're looking for um making some connections to to potentially get some job or internship um but it certainly seems very strong i think bc is probably is pretty decent as well but there it's definitely above and beyond holy cross i think than again most of my other friends that had uh, no place to go or, or, or no network to kind of reach out to. I specifically recall my junior summer, I actually spent the majority of time on Carroll Street off campus because I was working in insurance uh, internship. My buddy was working a medical device internship. And as we kind of went over our day in and day out, so I'm like, this sounds interesting. This is what I want to do. So the majority of my senior year, I was reaching out to alumni from my high school and to Holy Cross. And it was actually a surgeon, a current uh, surgeon still, who was a Holy Cross grad, um, who eventually ended up, again, it's a couple names here, a couple people there that he knew at medical device companies where, you know, that he would use their product or the hospital would buy his, uh, the hospital would use their product. Um, so it kind of gets you in the door and at least gives you an opportunity. Um, and, and that's really what I did. And, um, you know, when one door closes, I'd find the next Holy Cross guy out or the next extra graduate or whomever else can help me. And kind of exactly what I was saying earlier is that um, not to take no for an answer and to keep keep pushing for what you believe in. Um, you know, I wanted to do medical sales. So I've tried to find a way to make the connection between friends, parents who were surgeons that might know a medical device rep, Holy Cross graduates, like I said, and he was actually the gentleman that put me in touch with my first interview. Um, that turned into an offer eventually, you know, a couple months after graduation, probably. Um, and, and to me, that's just um, the beauty of this business, because I still recall the owners of the company saying to me, I think I was 24, they said, um, you know, why are you here sitting on my couch at this age looking for a job at Stryker when it's usually us interviewing guys that are not guys, but men and women that are 40. 45 that have years of experience in sales. They sold copiers, they sold wine, they sold ADP. They went through the whole build your resume to then go sell a medical device. And I gave my pitch as to why I believe that um, I was, you know, what they needed and that I had, you know, basically at that point I had no experience, right? That's kind of catch 22 when you graduate from college, everyone says you need experience. Well, how the hell are you supposed to have experience if you haven't had a job? Um, so I, I reference a lot of those things from school or from, from hockey and relationships. And um, that was a really telling time for me because eventually the company started looking at college graduates in the coming years, because kind of like what I just said about Cousins Maine Lobster, they could kind of um, teach and coach me what they wanted as a, as a younger person, probably pay me less, um, versus have somebody come in that's 45, worked for other companies and has a already this kind of mindset as to how it's supposed to go, um, you know, kind of have this potential tainted mind as to, and then they start to try and change the company's flow and, and processes, which is oftentimes harder than taking a great college graduate and grooming them. Um, so I digress, but uh, that is how I got my first interview and my first offer from a Holy Cross um, alum. And I think it's really important. Uh, one other story on, on that is actually uh, more on another, uh, guy from alumni affairs um, just recently has helped me get in touch with um, the former CEO of 7-Eleven. And I saw that there was something that he was doing with um, alumni having an event at his home. And to me, I'm always looking to try and get better and, and, and help our business. And the former CEO of 7-Eleven, which is one of the largest franchises in the world, would be a great place to start. Um, and you know, it happened. We got connected. We've had phone calls. Um, phenomenal guy. And, and um, you know, we'll be meeting up with him in a couple of weeks here uh, with our team. So, and, and there's synergy there, right? Um, so it was, uh, that's just another example of eight years later, how it's still in play. You know, that's really awesome to hear. Uh, I bet a lot of the students are sort of really happy to hear that, um, you know, Holy Cross grads are able to not only just, you know, maybe use it to get your foot in the door, but it sounds like, you know, the network really keeps going, you know, through many points in, in, in alums' careers. So that's definitely something encouraging to hear, especially as a rising senior myself. It's good to hear that, you know, people have had success using the alumni network. So that's just an awesome, you know, 
as students, we love to hear that. So sort of um, you were just talking about uh, your time at Stryker and you know, when people sort of look at your experience and sort of your career progression, some people might say, all right, well, medical devices and then lobster. So um, could you sort of speak to about how your time at Stryker, maybe how that helped you, uh, how it helped you develop and sort of mature into you know, starting your own business? So how, how did that time sort of shape you, would you say? Yeah, don't forget medical device lobster and before that political science and you can see that all three of them are connected um but I, but if anything that's that's a great takeaway for for all of you guys that eventually when you graduate is like you, you ask the liberal arts question well poli sci doesn't really scream medical device and it doesn't scream lobster but yet this this my own in my mind the strength of what we have as a business me as an individual um in any of those jobs comes from holy cross um in a lot of ways. So um, don't be so focused on, you know, liberal arts or, or what your major is. Um, but yeah, specifically, I mean, Stryker to me was, like I said, I, I love the job. It was so cool at that age. Um, like some of the managers I had said, you probably have the best stories at Christmas time and you're sitting around your family because you get to talk about going in an operating room and, you, and you're seeing these surgeries happen and you're helping with the impl implementation of your device. Ultimately, surgeons are, you know, obviously they were medically trained and we, we can't as reps give medical device um, or advice. But when it talks about the insertion point of a nail into your, into your hip, um, you know, our documentation tells us how your, our products and devices were best implanted for success of, of, um, of a successful outcome of a surgery, how a patient would heal best, um, where the screws needed to go so that they weren't protruding, they weren't too short, they weren't too long. So all those things that we learned specifically on our device is information that we could give a surgeon who's six feet away from us, a patient who's eight feet away from us, and a, and a sterile table in between with all such um, you know, implants and, and devices used for those surgeries. Um, ultimately what it was for me, you know, and it was in the Boston area, Leahy Clinic, uh, some downtown, Winchester Hospital, um, you know, it's, it's a sales job at the end of the day in that you were trying to grow your business. So there was the quota. There were sales that were on my plate to, to fulfill, um, to get more surgeons, to sell more product. It was a big relationship game. Um, and not a game, but a big, big strategy there because at the end of the day, I feel today like I did then, like I wasn't a snaky salesman. I wasn't the, the typical, you know, quote, used car salesman guy. I wasn't trying to make a pitch. I basically said, Hey surgeon, this this is me. This is who I am as a person. Um, if you like me, if you trust me, if you think that I'll learn my product inside and out better than the next person, so that when you turn and say, "What's the diameter of the nail?" and I know it right away, then you have trust. Ultimately, I build rapport with them because I just want to hang out with people that I like. And if I like you and you sell a product, then I'd rather buy from you than from somebody else. Um, I wasn't trying to like recreate the game. I just thought it really comes back from um, rather than like, you got five minutes left to purchase this product at 40% off. I mean, that type of thing doesn't work there. Um, so I, I built a pretty good book of business. The thing I really appreciated that it was kind of, we were kind of considered um, almost like you're running your own company. There weren't managers always all over you. I was out in the field during the day. I tried to go um, make new sales, form new relationships. And my successes, uh, management would obviously like or not like if you hit your quota. Um, and, and it was, it was a really, it was flexibility. I didn't have to go and sit at an office. That wasn't necessarily my gig, um, depending on who you are. Um, and so, so I love that. It taught me a lot about, um, speaking professionally and eloquently with, with medical staff, nurses, um, and trying to, again, accomplish a sale, even when it wasn't, um, you know, when you had two minutes at a scrub sink with a surgeon who's more focused on fixing somebody's hip than he is saying, oh, yeah, I'll use your new product next week. Um, so is that fine balance. And, and the one thing I took from it over the four or five years was that there were certain management styles that I didn't love. And then there were some that I thought were phenomenal. And so my dream ended up being with my cousin, how can we create a business and build a team and implement the culture um, and, and the styles of, of training and working with our team um, to make them feel really uh, that we are grateful for them um, and to make them feel appreciated. Um, and those are certain things I took. I took the good things from our management that I loved and I 
I left the ones that I didn't appreciate as an employee at the time. Um, and I hope that's kind of um, trickled down to Cousins Main Lobster today because there's a lot of information out there about, you know, people care more about culture and how they're treated than they are necessarily a financial increase. Obviously, you want both over time, but um, that type of um, environment seems to be very important. So that's what I got out of Stryker, and, and I think it was um, a really nice foundation for what we ended up doing with Cousins Main Lobster. So over those four or five years, you know, after you had spent some time learning those skills, sort of, you know, getting a feel for those leadership types and leadership skills you were talking about, when did you know it was time? When did you know that, you know, I, I want to start my own business? I want to go start Cousin Main Lobster. How, how, maybe how or when did you know it was time for you to start something on your own? Yeah, so about a quarter mile from where I live right now, I'm right uh, off Sunset Strip and in West Hollywood. And in 2011, I came out to actually see an ex-girlfriend. Um, but I figured that uh, since my cousin I grew up with in Maine lived out here, I'm like, well, we'll do. I'll we'll see both of them at the same time. Um, I ended up staying with my cousin probably 90% of the time. I hadn't seen each other in four or five years between him going to college and me college and the back and forth cross country. Um, but we just kind of hit it off again. And it, it sounds cheesy every time I say it, but you know, you just, it's like your best friends or family or whomever, you just kind of get back into that with the same humor, the same uh, kind of thoughts and passions and um, kind of vision is what you want to do. He was doing real estate sales, which was ultimately kind of similar to the, the, the day in and day out that I would have doing medical device sales. Um, and so a quarter away on sunset, we went to a really nice sushi dinner one night that we definitely probably couldn't afford. And, um, but, you know, just as a way to kind of, relax and chill out and we had a lot of martinis and sake and beer i'm sure you guys don't do that i'm not condoning it the um but you know it's college had too many of those and um that's kind of when we say the best ideas uh you know the, the cliche best ideas kind of happen when you're maybe uh, consume too much alcohol and uh what that really led to was in a very genuine place is that, you know, you kind of start going down memory lane. And we started talking about our grandparents in Maine, um, our uncles and aunts, we were big family guys, um, obviously our parents and our siblings and cousins. And we were just talking about um, those years growing up in Maine and that every weekend when we'd get together and do pool parties or go to the beach or go to the lobster shacks or we'd get together and do in our backyards uh, or for the holidays, whatever the hell it may be, um, we were, immersed with with love and close family and always lobster around and when we were younger like you don't really realize that that was a, a i mean we knew it was a treat but you didn't realize how maybe uh, how little access maybe other pockets of the country have to that um and so we said man wouldn't it be amazing if we could um do a business where we could treat the rest of uh, an area or southern california at the time to the high quality lobster we grew up with and make it something affordable for pricing, not an over, you know, not a $50 filet or lobster tail at a high-end steakhouse, but something that people could grab and go, that they could sit there and say, oh my gosh, I just saved myself a trip to Maine, but I'm tasting it the same way, the same quality, same integrity of the food. Um, and again, it sounds like a crazy idea. Went to bed, woke up with a little bit of a headache, and I went back to Boston, um, you know, a couple of days later but we just kept kind of talking to each other. This was 2011. Well, what if, would that idea work? Like, how would we get the lobster there? And would we do it out of a restaurant or food truck? Cause I didn't even know what a food truck was at this time because 2011 back East, there wasn't, there wasn't much in that way. Um, so we just kind of kept really going over. And I think what really made us keep going at it was um, we had a desire to do something on our own to represent our home state seemed pretty nice with, with the product, uh, you know, and, and obviously the fishing industry. Um, and to do something that was totally different and really not happening out in, in LA. Um, and that was it. We kind of thought, hey, this is a passion project. Let's see what happens. We have some free time. We had a little saved cash. Um, so I kind of worked a little bit on what the supply chain would look like, the distribution from Maine. Uh, Saban kind of went between restaurant and food trucks and started figuring out how many tickets the other trucks sell at a lunch or at a dinner, where we would go. Um, and so we settled on, I still remember being in a parking lot in Burlington, Massachusetts when he called me and said, we're doing a food truck. I said, great, let's do it. Didn't know anything else. 
And then we just kind of went to work. Um, like I said, I figured out the inventory, food, the product, the menu, and getting it out here. Um, and then he was working on the truck, management, team, where we would go, um, and how we would do sales ultimately. So that was kind of the beginning of, of all of that in 2011. Um, and then eventually came to fruition in 2012. Yeah, definitely a question that I had, you know, after doing a little bit of research into Cousins uh, myself is that as you guys expanded into some of those, uh, perhaps in, when thinking about lobster, sort of non-traditional markets, you know, thinking about like your Tennessee or Texas, how is the popularity uh, there, or at least in the beginning and now, with you know a product such as a lobster roll, that, that was something at least that I personally had a question about. Because when I think lobster, I'm thinking New England. So, how, how has that been in some areas that maybe don't traditionally get as much lobster? It's a great question. Um, and if I if you were talking to me in 2012, I'd say there's no way these other cities are going to do what we did in Los Angeles in terms of monthly or annual sales. There's just no way. We opened in 2012 to a line of like 60 people. We had nine or 10 employees on the truck that had never trained, never toasted a bun, um, never put lobster in a bun because we were so far behind. We didn't have a register um, and we were about 45 minutes late opening our truck. But people love the food. Uh, Saban and I spoke to all the customers in line. They loved the authenticity, loved knowing where the food came from um, and the story. So we said, we think you got something here. Um, again, that was day one. So we're a little naive. Um, but we grew our corporate trucks for the next two years or so uh, to four trucks in Los Angeles. And that's all we knew at the time. We knew how sales would work with a truck in the LA, Orange County area. Um, and they were pretty solid as, as a frame of mind, you know, uh, or, or reference point. A good month for our trucks here could be $80,000, $85,000 a month per truck, something like that. Um, we then go into these other cities over the course of, of the last six years in franchising. And we wondered the same thing you did, Tom, what would it be like in Raleigh? Mm, I don't know. It might not be as good. Memphis, Columbus, Pittsburgh, Vegas, uh, Nashville, to your point, um, small beach towns. Um, generally speaking, New Englanders know the quality and the value of lobster. They understand that it's not going to be a 12 inch foot long from Subway for six bucks. It's going to be, a traditional hot dog bun with lobster meat in it for 17 or 18 dollars more in, in many cities in new england so that was always our fear or concern uh originally and all of those cities have pretty much crushed la in sales um our best city for an individual truck now could do 200 250 thousand dollars a month um you know and so what that shows you in terms of numbers is how many more lobster rolls they're selling to your point so if you speak about a Memphis, we just opened an Oklahoma City, um, Columbus, where you might be sitting there thinking, well, can, will the price point be accepted? Will they appreciate lobster? What it's really come down to is, is kind of a, a craze and, a, and a, an appreciation for, like I said earlier, making a high quality product accessible where generally it's not. Um, and I won't take shots at, at other businesses because I'm not into that, but there are some other groups that they may have understood, oh, well, this is where I used to go. And then they realize this product is much better for $2 more, whatever it may be. Um, or there was nothing at all for an option there. And so now there is. And so they get to treat themselves or celebrate or have it as often as they want. It's not like chicken sandwich, like you have this once a week, twice a month, something like that, um, based on, on what cities we're in. But it's been phenomenally well received. Um, and I think what we found is that the pockets of the country that we are in that are not your major cities have actually done done the best. Wow, that's very interesting. Uh, I guess that's something that, you know, if you, at first glance, you definitely wouldn't expect, but that's something that's, now that you explain it, I guess, it, you know, it does make a lot of sense. So that's awesome. So as you guys, uh, you know, at Cousins uh, began to grow, uh, you know, I think a lot of people, you know, in this talk and a lot of people in general, you know, when they hear that you're on Shark Tank, you know, that's definitely something, you know, it's a popular television show, something that a lot of people would be interested in hearing about. So sort of how how important instrumental was, you know, Shark Tank uh, to your growth? And also just uh, what was the experience like? How did you even get started with Shark Tank? And, you know, what was the whole experience like for you and your cousin? Yeah, of course. It's, um, it's a pretty interesting story, actually. It's, uh, you know, most of these shows, American Idol, um 
you know, Shark Tank, The Voice, whatever it may be, they have what, what is considered open casting calls. So they go across the country and hundreds or thousands of people come through and you get one minute or 30 seconds to sing or pitch your business. And maybe you get a call back and then go and go and go and see if you filter down to the final 60 people that will make it on Shark Tank. And even from there, only 30 of them or so will actually air. Um, we actually had Shark Tank reach out to us. On the first night of business that I referenced when we were an absolute nightmare of an operation, um, you know, that was, uh, we got it picked up by a little local digital company out here. Um, kind of like your Eater LA or Eater Boston. Um, and they pitched and said, these two cousins from Maine are bringing lobster rolls to the West Coast. Um, Shark Tank casting was in line. They had our food. Uh, they kind of been following our, our coming soon story. They reached out to us via email and phone call that night when we got home. Saban and I always say we're sitting there counting $7,000 of cash on his living room floor. We had no bank account even set up, didn't know what to do with it. Um, meanwhile, we're emailing and calling <clears throat> this group from Shark Tank. Um, and they were in season three at the time, I think. I knew what the show was. Saban never heard of it. Um, so we started doing our research on it a little bit. Um, and not necessarily to bore you, but over the next two to four weeks of going back and forth with the producers, we ultimately said, um, you know, in, in, in them reaching out to us, they were inviting us and saying, do you kind of want to pass all of those 50, I think it's like 60,000 applicants that do these open casting calls and be considered to come on the show? Um, and we said no. And that was about a month into business. And we went by our way and did more business. And uh, about two weeks later, they called us back and said, are you sure you guys don't want to do this? We've never had a food truck. You guys seem great. Uh, people love your food. It could be a really nice uh, working for both sides. And we said no again. And then finally, uh, an executive producer called us. There's only two. And one of the executive producers of the show called us and said, if you guys don't do this, you'll be making the biggest mistake of your life. Um, so then we said, yes, um, we ultimately didn't, the first times that we said, no, we, we had so such little business, right? If you watch the show, you know, they, they really rely on history, not just projections. They rely on data and, and, and meaning and where you are getting your so-called valuation from. And when you have a month worth of business, it's kind of hard to do that with a straight face. Um, that was one reason we were kind of concerned of telling the whole country what our idea was so that we didn't want necessarily copycats. Um, so ultimately we said, we said yes when the executive producer called us and three months into business, we were in the studio shooting the show. Um, it is as real of a reality show as I think there is. We've done a few of them since and then a lot of kind of different uh, media that you see the behind the scenes on. Um, but it, when I say it's as real, what you see, those doors open, you walk down, you take your mark. Um, they kind of freeze you for like two minutes. They actually, there's, you know, 20 feet away from you, these sharks are. Um, and it's just quiet and they're just looking at you and grilling you in the eyes and they're just trying to make you shaking your booties a little bit. Um, and then someone from behind a camera just yells out, go. And then you do what you see as the kind of pitch, the minute and a half pitch. This is our business. This is what we're doing. This is the valuation, what we're asking for. Then from there, it's, it's literal back and forth Q and A um, as, you can, as you could think. There's no stopping, no stopping to edit or reshoot. Um, the only thing that they really do at the end of it is edit down. We were in there for about an hour and 10 minutes. Um, they edited it down to 12 or 13 minutes. Uh, we got a home package, which is when they fly to Maine and shoot that little um, intro scene. But they edited it down so that they take a face you make that's about something, and then they kind of parlay it into a question that Cuban asked they, that wasn't how the events went. And that's kind of what creates the drama. But has nothing to do with, with it being a real setup. So that's what it was. It was an interrogation for, uh, for a solid hour or so. Um, we went in there um, as prepared as I think physically possible on our end so that we kind of went in saying, listen, we need to know our business, our numbers, every single shark through and through. We watched all the Shark Tank episodes. We Googled everyone um, to make sure what they did as kids, what their high school job was, what their passion was. We learned that Damon was uh, a waiter at Red Lobster. Pretty good to know. Um, all of those type of things that we had, we knew what questions they would ask entrepreneurs 
on the show so that when they would ask, we knew the answer before they finished asking the question. So to us, it was just being able to convey our business or speak professionally in a calm manner, not come across as defensive like a lot of those groups get, not get kind of caught without having an answer, um, you know, which is just a way to kind of look foolish. Um, and so we thought we, we had the best chances possible if we did that. Um, Barbara actually tells us today, you know, they wear these earpieces and the producers, they can know if, if the sharks are going to want to go in or out. Um, but sometimes they'll say, you know, just stay in and try and get these guys razzed up. And she said that. She said the producers would tell them in their ear, these guys are too right here. They're just, they're calm and try and get some emotion out of them. And she's like, we just couldn't. Um, and to me, that was kind of the, the, the plan to say, this is who you'd be investing in. Like it's a, it's a small little sampling of what your partner is like. It's like for us with franchisees, they come here for two days and spend time with us before we commit um, to awarding a territory. We take them out at the night, we take them to get some booze in their system and see if they do anything weird uh, or if they say something that's a red flag. So, you know, I want to know who we're going to be in uh, a long-term relationship with. And I think that's what we wanted to show to the Sharks is this is, this is us. This is who you'll get a, a day later and eight years later. Um, that's actually how it's, it's really developed with Barbara. So um, in terms of a platform or opportunity, obviously it's massive. I mean, 9 million people were watching when we aired in 2012. We've had six follow-ups since. Um, and, you know, we've had a lot of good, I guess, stories or new pieces to share. But ultimately, Shark Tank doesn't make you successful, doesn't make you a millionaire, doesn't make your business work when it didn't work before, for example. Um, and I think that's sometimes... In, the perception of people is that, oh shit, you, excuse my language, you, um, you uh, go and, and um, you're selling bagels or lobster rolls or you have this trinket. Uh, it's been a hard go. You've never made it over the, you know, over the top, but because you go on TV, everything's going to be hunky dory moving on. Like you're, if you weren't successful before, now everything's fixed. Like it's really not like that at all. What, what we showed was 9 million people, um, our business, and those that could find us in Los Angeles, would come, like I said, and we had a target on our back. They say, I drove here from three hours away. I came from 20 minutes away. I stood in line for three hours. Um, this better be the best lobster roll I've ever had because you told me it was on TV. Um, and you could have the best product, but if the person in our window wasn't nice and wasn't pleasant, you failed on customer service. If we didn't pick the lobster meat correctly and you got a little shell in it, then the lobster could still be phenomenal, but the eating experience wasn't great. If the truck was dirty, then you have a different kind of understanding when you're a customer standing in line. Um, so there's all kinds of different pieces that um, after Shark Tank is when the real work starts, like I said. So it gave us a platform ultimately um, to share our story and our business to ultimately the country. And that to me is the biggest opportunity it provided then and still does now. Um, you know, the fact that we got to share that story means that uh, Mariah Carey knew about it. She comes into our restaurant. That we get to go on Kathleen Hoda on the Today Show. That we were on GMA with Michael Strahan. That we get an Entrepreneur Magazine. It doesn't just happen. We keep working on it. We keep on stories and keep pitching and pitching and pitching. But maybe they knew about it because they remembered us on Shark Tank. Now it's like, hey, we just went on the Kelly Clarkson show two months ago. Maybe people or audience that never followed us or knew about us, but they're fans of Kelly Clarkson, say, oh, I remember these lobster guys. Kelly loved their chowder. Um, so that's what all kind of started from Shark Tank. But the work uh, really just began after we aired. Yeah, so it's, it really sounds like it provided you guys with some great sort of national exposure, which is, I think, was, must yeah. have been super important. I'm definitely glad to hear, you know, I, I love Shark Tank, one of my favorite shows. Glad to hear it's not one big setup. Glad to hear it's pretty real. Yeah. So I know we're uh, planning on opening up to Q&A soon, but I do have... Uh, one last question for you before we open it up to everyone. And, you know, I know this is a topic that we've all been talking about a bunch and we've all been hearing about, you know, the pandemic and COVID-19. But um, I guess I'll sort of just frame this as one big question. But first off, how has COVID-19 you know, affected, you know, your business? How have you been able to sort of, uh, you know, change some practices or able to adapt. And then also, as we were talking about earlier, you graduated uh, from Holy Cross 2008, another uh, pretty tumultuous time uh, in this country, given, you know, the financial crisis and, you know, now 
where in seeing similar uh, similar activity in uh, the economy. So if you have any advice uh, to maybe some current students or even graduating seniors about graduating into is sort of into a market like this, that would be great. Yeah, of course. Um, so I'll touch on COVID, I guess, with our business. Um, when this started happening in early March or so, um, you know, every day, just national news got worse and worse and worse for everybody. Unemployment, businesses, jobs, I mean, can't help but feel for everybody. And it's not like maybe a way where it was a little bit more of um, one sector than another. It's literally everything you can think of is just getting hit. And if it wasn't today, it's tomorrow. Um, so when this happened, we basically, again, you kind of talk about your, your roots or your training, your education, in school. Um, whatever you want to say. When I graduated Holy Cross, I, play, I was the most prepared. I was the most organized. I was the most um, motivated uh, or creative thinking. Whatever those things are, um, that's what we kind of relied on. Myself, my cousin, our vice president, and you know the rest of our six or seven crew um, to sit there and say, what is this going to look like? What are we going to do right now when we started getting a sniff of what this could be? So maybe it was even late February um, and how we would be ahead of it. Um, so, for example, there was about 20 things we did with our franchisees. Uh, some of them were financial in the sense of, um, you know, there's a, a marketing fee that we take from franchisees monthly, which we uh, deferred ultimately. Well, they didn't even defer. We just suspended um, to try and keep some cash in their pockets for the sustainability of their business. Um, and then we went on the, on the safety and health side. Uh, we have digital TVs on every truck um, that fortunately we had um, set up about a year and a half, two years ago. And all of those went from converting instead of beautiful images of food and videos of Maine to social distancing to what we're doing um, from a cleanliness standpoint um, so that customers could feel ultimately comfortable um, and safe that when they come eat our food, because everyone still does need to eat, um, that they would be eating in a, in a controlled and safe environment. Um, we had an app that we developed. So you think about Starbucks and the way that you order, um, order on your phone, contact us, have it delivered, or excuse me, go pick it up. Um, that is what we had with our, our food trucks as well. So probably about 75% of our business um, transitioned to the app where people could order from their car, from their house, they go pick it up. Um, very little wait time and, and interaction with, with staff. Um, so that was a real positive. Um, and then everything from spacing people out, managing those lines. Um, and the biggest thing that we tried to get ahead of was saying, we have a mobile unit. We have, we have trucks, which is the majority of our business outside of our restaurants, um, that are on wheels. So it used to be event-driven business. You would go to Coachella, you would go to music festivals, you would go to farmer's markets, you would go where the people congregated. Well, now we have the ability, unlike a restaurant, um, to drive to a homeowners association, to drive to a neighborhood, to drive to a parking lot um, that is a grocery store or where all the retail locations are closed. And we can market the way that we do through our app and through Facebook and other devices to let people know that we are going to be here and to come stand outside in the fresh air, six feet apart, um, and grab your food. We, had to do, we ended up doing family meals so they could grab lobster and go home because ultimately a lot of people started cooking in their house. Um, right? That's why grocery stores pretty much emptied out. That's kind of the only options you had. And people started liking the idea of cooking in their home um, for the most part. Um, and what could you do with um, lobster meat? How could you use it? How could you do something with different fish and meats and proteins that you try to get at the grocery store? So we deployed all these things and what it ultimately turned into for our restaurants as well that were able to stay open um, was sales that uh, were ahead of our projections before COVID hit. Um, so knock on wood and we're extremely grateful because like i said we thought we were going to be um you know in a similar boat as many others um and i think that you know that's ultimately how we prepared for it how we kind of rolled out some things that we thought would help um and it, it we kind of surpassed our our original projections for q1 and q2 um and then it ultimately shows you some pieces of your business that are that are we didn't plan for, we sure as hell didn't know in 2012, we're like, hey, we'll do a food truck. Um, it's just inherently part of the mobility of it. Our quick serve restaurant, same thing. You know, the one here in LA that we own is even when, even when it's, we don't rely on, I don't know where everyone lives here, but if you think of those big restaurants or if you think of, you know, the North End in Boston or New York, 
Um, the thing I love about those spaces, the ambiance, the environment, your elbow to elbow with the table next to you, you're clinking glasses with them. Well, if they need to be cut down to 25% of people now as they start to open, very hard to make things work. It's just the reality. Your payroll, your lease, all of your expenses, and then try to make profit, it's going to be hard because um, they rely on full restaurants or a cheesecake factory. It needs 400 people in every Friday night, turn and burn, and keep go, 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 and you need every table full. Um, as a frame of mind for hours, people kind of come in, they go out. It's just that constant traffic, pick up, grab and go, deliveries, two people sitting over there, 10 feet apart, there's a family of four, an outside patio. So the nature of the quick serve restaurants we have is still allowed for some really positive sales um, and people feeling comfortable and being able to operate in these such times. So again, nothing we knew then, but it's actually uh, been pretty stable, uh, all considering. Um, so that's kind of what COVID has done to our business. I think inevitably it makes you think of what's the next thing, you know, before you take your foot off the gas. Um, you know, generally speaking, it's kind of like, hey, there's our mentality is there's some competitor or someone that's working every day to try and take from us what we've built. Um, we never knew that a COVID was sitting around the corner. I don't think anybody probably did. Um, there could be a financial crisis, but this is like something no one's ever seen. Add the riots into place and the protests, um, and that obviously hurts people's businesses as well, um, you know, doubling down on the impact from COVID. But uh, my takeaway from this with our business and for students, graduates um, uh, now or in a year or so, um, to me is that there's always a silver lining and there's always opportunity. Um, and it sounds maybe cliche, but you got to find it. Um, especially if this group here or anyone listening to this is, is that entrepreneurial mindset. Um, you got to be ready to rock and drive through any wall that's presented to you, um, whether it's an interview, whether it's school, or whether it's someday when you're graduating into an environment that maybe wasn't as great as four years ago, uh, two years ago, a year ago for that matter. <clears throat> I think there's, um, you know, we always say for our business, what else could we have done? Um, what is the silver lining? Well. Um, pretty much everyone under the sun stopped buying lobster meat, except for us. So maybe there's an opportunity there to be working with our team in Maine um, to build more inventory, to get more supply, to get better pricing for our franchisees so that when this comes back, their cost of goods goes down and they're more profitable and it helps them make up for if there were delays during these past few months. Um, you know, I think there's always the idea in our business of um, and like anything, maybe we'll get better opportunity, better lease deals um, because vacancies on restaurants or anything are, are going to increase. Um, and landlords are going to be looking to make uh, maybe some better deals than they would when everything under the sun was full. Um, and that is not at the mercy of those restaurateurs that didn't may, maybe make it through this. That's not, I'm not trying to take advantage of that, but it is looking at and saying, hey, what could you be working on? We're looking at a lot of technology to say, hey, we had the app now, we had the TV screens, but how, while we're a food company and, a, and trying to create some happiness company, there's also tech. How do we make it easier for people as you young kids now at Holy Cross come out and there's some other way to uh, you know, get in touch with you or to communicate with you guys? Um, so those are the type of things. And so if you're graduating, I think, yeah, of course, the unemployment rate's real. Um, but I do think there are ways to position yourself, to find ways to find opportunities, um, and to continue to uh, add to your creating an asset, making yourself an asset, so that some company is going to want you. Um, we're we're hiring. We just hired a, a, a woman from uh, USC um, at what I would say is a really competitive salary for somebody coming out of college at the age of 24. Um, and I don't know as though she had other places to go. She did before COVID, but then some of those opportunities went off the table. We wanted her very badly. Um, so those are the type of things. You might, she might not have known of our company. You may not know of companies like ours in your hometown or in your neck of the woods, um, but do more to find them because there are still people that are wanting to grow. Think about grocery stores, how much they crush it um, right now. There are many other businesses that while some are suffering um, that are growing or, or that are needing um, amazing people. So. Um, this too shall pass, but until then, uh, try and find that silver lining. Absolutely. So thankfully, it sounds like, you know, you guys were able to adapt and sort of, you know, 
be forward thinking and make it through. And that, that's awesome. And thank you for, you know, all the advice, especially for those of us graduating. I know there are a lot of students, you know, watching live and all, a lot who will be watching this video uh, on the Power Talks website as well. So that's definitely well appreciated. And now uh, I know it's uh, past five o'clock, so I will be passing it on to Professor Klingard for uh, the Q&A section of today's presentation. But uh, Jim, thank you for uh, talking with me today. I had a great time you know, learning more about you, learning more about Cousins Maine Lobster, and uh, hopefully we get some good questions and uh, be able to keep talking. Awesome. Thanks for, thanks for running the show. Of course. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Jim. That, that was that was really great. Um, I, you know, you you said uh, you, some people might have to struggle with Professor Klinghardt giving them a D. I'm not sure you ever had that uh, specific problem, uh, but uh, but uh, for for someone who's brought the the beauty of lobster tots into the world, you've definitely made a <laughs> for it. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, we have some time for uh, for uh, some questions. Uh, if you would like to ask a question, what I'd like you to do is. Take your video mute off. Take your um, uh, and raise your hand, and then when when I call on you, take your your uh, your mute off. Um, so if you if you have questions, I can uh, I can see everybody here. Um, I, my my question for you while while people are gathering their thoughts, um, you didn't talk a lot about uh, about uh, food about your about your history as uh, how you came to 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 appreciate making food and and you know I, I just wonder if that's a big part of your management of your oversight of the of the company is thinking about new res uh, new uh, new recipes thinking about uh sort of how how the food is actually prepared uh how does how did how did you go from medical device uh which is uh, you're not mixing the the recipe for the screws and the bowl <laughs> Uh, to something where you're having to tell people how much butter to put on the on the grill to to to, yep. to round the lobster roll. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Um, and it's I'm kind of laughing at myself for not talking about it. Um, but there's a, a few different pieces to that I guess I think like if you've heard me speak, it's like you know the idea was to represent Maine and and uh, support the fishery and do something that we were passionate about. And um, it's a food truck and it's definitely food. Um, but it's also, there's, there's technology in our business. There's customer service. There's like kind of creating happiness is what we're trying to do, right? Like I'm blown away when I see people without us doing it, just Instagramming these photos and sending it to their friends and taking the first bite. I just started realizing early on, like, I don't do that about a burger. And a lot of people don't do that about a slice of pizza or a taco. But this food is, is so niche and different and it creates this uh, emotional connection to Maine or New England or um, this admiration of food that makes them do this kind of on their own and so um, food is obviously at the core of what we do um, but we make sure all those other pieces around it uh, need to be executed so maybe that's why I forgot the product but we did say from day one we will always serve the best lobster in the world um, it needs to be a 10 and a lot of companies especially in the food space as they get it established and they grow their business they'll start knocking down the quality of their food now uh, they save on costs of goods, they start making more money, but ultimately to me, you wouldn't have the retention and the returning customers that expect the same thing on year eight that you had on year one. Um, so as the lobster prices fluctuate like wine or other, um, you know, other products like that that will change with season supply and demand, we always said we're committed to, to buying even when it's higher. And if that means we need to absorb it, us or the franchisees, or if we can, increase the price a bit to try and help alleviate some of that burden. We always wanted the, the, the product, the lobster, to be a 10. Um, within there, then it was literally trial by fire from 2012. I mean, it was how much butter are we putting on this? How much mayonnaise is going inside the roll? How much pico de gallo is going on the tacos? And that was plug and play until we started developing these, you know, our now recipe book that every franchisee has um, and is expected to do the same way every time um, so that when it goes out the window, it's the best food. Um, there should not be butter smudges on the wax paper um, because that drives me crazy. And that's just a visual thing. It has nothing to do with the food itself. Um, and there's language from greeting you at the, re at the truck or at the restaurant and, and send off language. Uh, there's apparel. There's all these other pieces that go in so that when you eat that $17, $18 lobster roll, yes, the product should always taste phenomenal, but everything else in your brain is like, oh my God, the person was so nice or helpful. Or they looked clean and well represented of the brand. Um, interesting note on the, on the food that we did not know in the beginning. Our lobsters are all cooked in Maine. 
and the meat is sent to us. So a lot of it is, um, you know, we saute the lobster meat on the, it's cooked. So we just, all we're doing is taking the chill off it and a little bit of butter in the skillet, and then it's going into the lobster roll. The bread is from Maine as well. Um, that's because that's what we grew up with as kids. Um, every seafood actually is from Maine. It's produce or dry goods that are from a local town. Um, but we have the ability to do very high volume in a short amount of time. We used to watch other trucks line and if you were standing 20, foot, 20 people back at the grilled cheese truck, but you were 20 feet back at our truck, we may both have 20 or whatever, 50 people in line, but they're waiting for their food to cook through and it's taken six, eight, 10 minutes. We can make a lobster roll in 15 seconds. So we can turn our line, which was just the nature of our product. We never knew when it happened or when we were starting. So again, it was focused on the food that the quality of the product was coming to us at a 10 um, and that we would execute it out the truck at a 10. Um, in terms of recipes, yes, we have added things over the course of the last three or four years to kind of keep it fresh and, and you know, lobster grilled cheese. Um, we've done fish and chips. We've done whole belly clams. We've done, um, what did we add? We added uh, the lobster tots, as you referenced. That was about two and a half years ago. So we try and add a few things over the course of a year uh, to keep it fresh and give customers more more variety. I, th I think that that's an important thing about, about food is, you know, you can serve the product, but if you haven't taken the care to serve it right, there's nothing more disappointing than expecting that, uh, that great taste and getting something that's just not, not right. So right. That's, right. I appreciate that. Uh, any other, other questions from our, from our audience? Mark? Oh, uh, Let's see, we have, uh, no, no, I can't see your name. Um, you who just, yeah, yeah, with your hand up. Uh, I, I can't see your name now for some reason, but go ahead. Sorry, that's okay. No, no, um, no, no. Now I see it. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Um, oh, so thank you, Jim, for um, sharing your story. It's been really cool to listen to. And I was just wondering, you kind of mentioned that early on in your college experience, you thought you might want to go to law school. And then after college, you did medical sales things. Um, and so I was just wondering, like, had you always thought that you wanted to be an entrepreneur? Or was it something that you didn't think was like very secure? Or you didn't know like, what you maybe wanted to pursue in that way? And so you didn't really get started with it until you had that idea with the food trucks? Oh. Yeah, good question. I'll be, um, I think for me, I just always wanted to, I think that's why medical devices or a sales job fit me is because there was some autonomy in it that day to day I was kind of running my own show, right? I was, it was my responsibility that I was tasked with to grow the business, do more sales, get more relationships um, versus someone sitting over my shoulder all day long, maybe at, at some other type of job. Um, so I don't know as though I knew when I left school, actually, no, I didn't sit there and go, oh, I'm graduating, I wanna be an entrepreneur, I wanna start my own business. What I did wanna do was have my own control. Um, and not out of an ego sake, but out of, I would like to do things, like I played hockey, right? Um, of the way the team was run, uh, whether it's coaching style or um, those things, I think you can say, I love these tactics, or I don't like those, but someday if I have control of my own business, cause I'm not going to coach my own hockey team, these are things I'd like to bring in. It's like, what'd your mom and dad do? You know, you take these type of lessons that you loved how they raised you and then these ones, eh, not so much. Um, and that kind of happened again at Striker too. And so I ultimately wanted to have control of my own, um, not, I don't want to say destiny, but like, I didn't know that it was going to be in the form of a business. And if I did think that I wanted to start my own business, uh, a few years into Striker, I sure as hell didn't think that it was going to be serving lobster rolls out of a food truck. Um, that just came up as, as the way that I mentioned to you. So I think for me, and it's not even about security because the reality is I had a very secure job. I had a 401k, I had uh, nice earnings, and I had uh, my friends and family in Boston and my parents in Maine two hours away. Uh, the opposite of security was saying, I'm going to go start a food truck. I said it at my wedding. It's like probably my wife uh, my current wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, you know, it's not the best story for the girlfriend to be like, yeah, my, my boyfriend's going to start a food truck. Like, you know, it doesn't have a lot of legs to it necessarily when you, when you say it like that. So move across country, uh, have revenue from one food truck, two business partners to split that. Um, and when you start anything, the majority of your money's going back into it. So it wasn't this 
you know, sexy opportunity with a lot of upside at the time. But it was something, like I said, no matter what you do, if you believe in it, you're passionate, um, and you're going to work your tail off um, to make it what you think it can be, even if you don't know what it will be at the time, uh, then I think there's the opportunity and, and the security that you can eventually develop. Great question, Noel. Uh, I think we have time for one one last question. Yeah. Uh, I just want to, uh, my name's Jacob Ozzy. I'm a rising sophomore at Holy Cross. I just want to thank you again for your time and telling us your story. Um, I just had a, a bit of a random question, but I was curious to see your response. You know, nowadays we live in a world that is consumed by social media and it's quite helpful for a lot of businesses that want to start from scratch. You, you know, you can build your brand through social media. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your experience, because I saw that you guys have a pretty cool Instagram page. Um, so Talk a little bit, a little bit about like your experience with social media, and if you have any like general advice for students or college students or whoever in general wants to start their own business, and how they could use social media for their own benefit. Yeah, sure, great question. And certainly, I did not touch on this, but social media for us is is massive, um, and it's developed and it's evolved over the course of time. Originally, again, one food truck to now you have a franchise. So. What do you allow the franchisees to do and control versus what we do corporately? What's the messaging? What's the voice? Um, what's the quality? Um, franchisees have access to their local Facebook, but they have a, grant, a brand guidelines that they need to stay within for posting. Um, Facebook has a nice connection locally, meaning if you're a Raleigh franchisee or in Memphis, uh, you're probably better off as that with the local roots um, that you have. We always try to highlight our owners um, to make it feel really like it's you know local grown and that these guys, men, women, whoever it may be, are, are running it and they are feet on the ground there. Um, Instagram for us is, is national, it's corporate. Uh, we run that, um, but we oversee everything. Uh, the reason for that is to your point, you know, controlling the voice and the message is critical for us because one wrong misstep, you know, knock on wood, can come back to bite you uh, pretty good as you, as you can see in almost any space today. Um, and so I think for us, that's, that's always something we've worked on is, is making sure that the photos, um, we don't embellish the photos, um, what you see for our food are the right ounces. Um, so it's telling the customer, um, you know, what you see is what you should be getting. Um, the quality of food, excuse me, the photos matter a lot to us. We don't want these grainy iPhone photos. Um, and that's not to make it look like something that's not. It's because you pay a lot for this food and this is what it should look like. Um, I don't want my mother taking a, a shot with her iPhone because it'll come out and you won't be able to see the thing. Um, but there are people that would do that, franchisees that would do that early on. Like, what the hell are we doing here? We can't have that representing the brand. Um, so that's how we would then update our operations manuals and what was um, allowed or not allowed. And, and then, of course, there are people who need to be heard, customers, whether you have a complaint, whether you have a question, whether you're reaching out on Facebook or Instagram. Um, you need to have the communication. So you should see that the majority of our, our cities that are performing well really do have that responsiveness um, to make the customer heard because ultimately it's a sale that's, that's waiting there potentially for you um, or it's a returning customer. It's creating that, that loyalty. Um, but yeah, social media is obviously, um, you know, very big for us and letting, letting people know where we are, where we'll be, um, what we're about. And I think that the biggest thing for us 30,000 foot view is being authentic and telling our story. Um, I didn't really say that earlier, but no matter who you are, if you're graduating college, if you're starting a business, if you're selling pencils, if you have a family owned business, there's something innate to you or that business that you need to share. And most people miss that boat completely. Uh, whether you watch Shark Tank, whether you watch, go Google any of your businesses, they may show you the product that is the coolest sunglasses in the world but they may not tell you that they went to Fiji and that they found a dude that had these cool little glasses on the island. <clears throat> and then they went and sourced the product from there and that they're handmade there. And it's so inspiring to them because uh, X, Y, and Z. Um, and those type of things matter. Like ultimately we didn't know what we were doing, but when we talked about we're cousins and we're family and we're very close to a closely knit family. And it's all about kind of love and growing up. Sounds cheesy, but that's true. Um, we talk about the best product we got to eat as kids and we have to bring to the masses. That's true. When you get to talk about and share those kind of personalities and interactions, 
people start, it's a movement. People start resonating when they go, well, I could get a lobster roll from that guy who's got a dirty truck or just sitting there and say, I, I buy it from Boston. But if we can tell them what we're about, then they go, oh yeah, you know, like my, my son's really close to his cousin too. Or I remember that trip we took to Maine and these guys are showing the connection to their fishermen and the authenticity of that story. Um, those are things that I think are really important to do. Because at the end of the day, the influencer or the paid sponsorships or these little bells and whistles will eventually wear out. Um, and so, uh, or cost too much to do, or certain people will say like, it's quite obvious when you look at Google and you see an ad spend um, that is maybe not as genuine as the company that's got a better quality, better story, um, better kind of mission to share. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. And I want to thank you, Jim. Thank you, Tom. This has been phenomenal. I don't know about everyone else on the on the call, but I feel like I could listen to to this interview for about five more hours. So, um, Jim, thank you so much for sharing thank all of the fantastic ways. Yeah, and Tom, awesome questions. Fantastic. Um, want to let everyone else know that this recording, as I mentioned, will be put up on the Power Talk website once it's ready. So it's something that you can revisit again, try and soak in all that great information um, and share with your friends who weren't able to participate because I think there's a lot that all of us will take away from this conversation. I'll, I'll pass it over to Daniel to, um, to let everyone know about what's coming up next uh, for our next Power Talk. Thanks, Maura. Thanks. Uh, one thing uh, we've been doing at the JD Power Center is trying to sort of distill down some sort of qualities that we try to encourage in in our students to go out into the world. And and some of the the things that we have been trying to think about are things that you sort of referenced naturally without sort of prompting things like you know I love how you did your research before you went into Shark Tank so you knew what to expect you found that that tidbit about uh, about the guy working at Red Lobster and and making that connection um, the attention to quality uh, 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 as opposed to just chasing uh, profit or just chasing uh, a few more dollars few more savings here but but that uh, integrity is coming from quality and also just the care for the people who work for you that that you that really comes across as, as part of what your business is, is about that's that's really great so I really uh, uh, really appreciate it um, so the, for the for everybody else uh, we hope you'll join us next week on Tuesday June 23rd at 7 o'clock uh, we'll hear from dr. Helen Boucher a Holy Cross alumna who's currently serving as Chief of Infectious Diseases at Tuff Medical Center. Her insight into careers in the medical field as well into this current public health crisis should be interesting to everybody, but we'd encourage you, especially if you've got a friend who's a pre-med student, to, 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 to invite them to come. And we hope that if there's a particular kind of power talk that you or your friends would like to hear, that you'll email us at jdpowercenter at holycross.edu. Uh, we are here for you in this uncertain time, and we'd love to get your feedback and for, to, for you to let us know what we can do to help you out. So can we all uh, give Jim a, a, a thanks? We can all come off a of mute and, uh, and say thanks and give him a round of applause there. Doesn't necessarily work so well. Hey, on. Guys. <laughs> I get the idea. I appreciate it. It was, it, was, it was a lot of fun for me too. So thank you guys for uh, tuning in. And Good. All, right. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you.